Hi, I'm Nick Bott, founder of Gentleman Coders and developer of the Raw Power photo editing application. I'm here today to talk about Pro Raw editing, how Pro Raw compares to other raw formats, and specifically how to edit Pro Raw files using some very specialized tools specific only to Pro Raw files. Let's talk about Pro Raw itself a little bit. The first question, of course, is are Pro Raw files really raw? Well, Yes and no. A RAW is a minimally processed image. It should not have lots of camera processing, such as dynamic range compression, or looks, picture styles, that sort of thing. The work to create a nice looking image comes afterward by a software decoder after the image has been saved. In addition, a RAW file contains, well, RAW sensor values. In contrast, a Pro RAW file has a lot of processing applied to it. It takes advantage of all of Apple's computational photography goodness to create an image using multiple image fusion and other very advanced techniques. So it's not minimally processed. In addition, Pro RAW files are RGB files, not bare pattern. So as a result of that computational photography, Pro RAW files store full 12-bit RGB at every pixel as a linearized DNG. There is no debearing step for Pro RAW files. There's a common bit of confusion around the topic of linearized DNGs. Just because it's DNG doesn't mean it's raw. DNGs can hold data in different types of formats, both raw and linearized data as well. Linearized files are much larger than standard raw files because they have three times as much data at every pixel. You can see from this table that for the first two characteristics I talked about, that Pro-RAW files are less like RAWs and more like JPEGs or HEFs. But Pro-RAW also has a lot of the benefits of a conventional RAW file. Pro-RAW files have a wide gamut. They have deep pixels, as I mentioned, 12-bit. And instead of burning a lot of information into the actual pixel data, that information is stored as metadata, things like the white balance, for example. You get the same flexibility editing a Pro-RAW file as you would a conventional RAW. So in this second table, you'll see that for those other characteristics I just mentioned, a Pro RAW file is very much like a regular RAW as opposed to a JPEG. Also, look at that last column for JPEGs, and you'll see why JPEGs aren't really a great format for editing. First of all, the image data gets burned in with parameters like white balance or exposure compensation, which makes them difficult to fix later. They're compressed in a lossy fashion, so you're going to lose detail and information that way. They're only 8 bits, so you lose dynamic range. And they're gamma corrected, which means you're not working with linear data. So all those things make it harder to get great results with JPEGs versus raw or pro raw data. I won't spend time comparing images because there are tons of such comparisons out there. But I'll say that pro raw images are designed to look a lot like the Heath images that are produced from the built in camera app. They look very different from, and a lot better than, the raws from iPhones in the past. Here's an example of Heath image, and this is the Pro Raw. Very similar, not exactly the same. The, the Heath image has maybe a little bit better color and sharpness, but basically the same. Not every image is going to match that closely, but often they do. So Pro Raw files look pretty good out of the box, but we want to edit them. To show you how to edit Pro Raw files, I'm going to be using Raw Power version 3.2 which has special controls just for Pro Raw files. This control is not available for other linearized DNGs because it's specific to the Pro Raw format. I'm going to be demoing on the Mac, but everything that I'm showing you here runs exactly the same way with Raw Power for iOS. Here's Raw Power for iOS with a Pro Raw file loaded. Raw Power runs on both iPhone and iPad OS. I mentioned something called local tone mapping. So what is that? Well, tone mapping is the process of taking data that comes in a wide dynamic range and bringing it down to fit into a smaller dynamic range. A common use for that is HDR, any kind of image stacking where you've got a lot more image and image data than you can fit in the final output image that you're trying to create. Global tone mapping applies a single algorithm to the entire image. Local tone mapping applies tone mapping in pieces by analyzing each section of the image independently. Local tone mapping is hard to do because it's much more difficult to get an even looking image when you're analyzing the image in sections. But Apple has done a terrific job here. And there are three things you want to know about tone mapping. First is how local tone mapping interacts with contrast. 
Second is how local tone mapping works with exposure and how local tone mapping works with clipping and highlight recovery. As I mentioned earlier, contrast is sometimes a casualty of tone mapping. Apple's done a very good job, but some images don't have enough contrast, or maybe you just don't like Apple's tone mapping look. Here's our first image. The image is a little dark and kind of flat as well. Let's look at the upper right corner of the screen where the histogram is. You can see that the image has a plus two exposure composition, and even then, it's still pretty dark. We can also see why the image is so flat. Looking at the histogram, we can see that the color values are all clustered toward the center. Much of this is actually due to local tone mapping. So with raw power, we're gonna be focusing today on the very first slider called local tone map. It's the first control because it's the most important one for pro raw images. And as I mentioned, this slider does not appear for other raw formats. I'll cover the other sliders in this adjustment in another video. Watch as I drag the local tone map slider down. Wow, you can see it has a really big effect on both the bright and dark areas of the image. Look at the histogram as well, and you can see how the histogram spreads out as I decrease the effect of local tone map. For an image like this, the first thing I recommend is to turn LTM down just a little bit. I'm not sure what value I really want for local tone mapping, but I want to get it a little out of the way so I can work on the image. It spreads out the color a bit without compromising the image's look too much. Then I'm going to apply quick auto levels, which brightens up the image quite a bit. Then I'll apply a little bit of the lighten and deepen sliders to work on the shadows and the highlights. And then I'll go back to local tone mapping and I can dial it back now to kind of decide how much I want in that sky. So maybe about there. I can use the M key or press the control here, I'm circling, to show before and after. So again, you can see the image, how different it is, and also the histogram as well. Here's another example of why you might want to adjust LTM. While LTM works across the image in different ways, it's still trying to analyze and balance the entire image. If you aren't interested in the entire image because you're going to crop it, then it may be overcompensating in areas where you'd rather it didn't. In this image, there's a very bright area on the left. In this case, I'm going to crop that out anyway and focus on the right area by the wall and bulletin board. As I drag local tone map to the left, you can see how much detail emerges in the wall and in this bulletin board here. I'll turn it on and off so you can see. There may be other ways to do this with exposure, highlight, deep in, etc. But for Pro Raw, your first move should be LTM, especially if you're cropping the image because of the way local tone mapping affects the overall balance of the image. One of the goals of local tone mapping is to manage the visible range of the image, that is from zero to one or black to white. I already showed how it affects contrast, but you can also see how it controls the brighter parts of an image. This image is underexposed by two stops. Watch the histogram as I move exposure up. The histogram moves to the right as we'd expect, but then it suddenly seems to hit a wall. That is the effect of local tone mapping. It would appear that local tone mapping is only willing to brighten an image so far before it puts up a stop sign. If you have an underexposed pro raw image, consider sliding LTM down so you have more headroom and flexibility with the exposure slider. It may seem like I'm just criticizing local tone mapping, and I'm not, but for some images, it may just be best to turn local tone mapping off. This one is a little bit underexposed. Now, LTM is not magically making this image more balanced, so we'll do the work ourselves. Let's see what it looks like with and without local tone mapping. You can see that the image gets darker overall, but local tone mapping is not doing much, for example, for the foreground. So first, we're going to turn local tone mapping off completely. Then we'll do something we did before, which is auto levels. Then I'll add a little bit of exposure and a little bit of shadows. 
and now I can see it before and after. So the overall image hasn't changed a huge amount, but what we've gotten back is a really nice yellow in the sun and a little bit of that yellow reflecting onto the water as well. Before you think LTM is just a fancy auto levels, it's not. In fact, I was really surprised when I got this result the old fashioned way. But now we're at this point, we can easily advance the images look. We're clearly not done here, but since local tone mapping is not being run at all, then we can adjust the image without any effect from it. You might think we could have saved some time by just leaving local tone mapping on, but if we do, we will not be able to get that yellow back in the sun. So this is a great example of why you need control over local tone mapping. If you're gonna be converting to black and white or applying some kind of special effect, then I think it's important for you to combine whatever effect you're applying with some management of local tone mapping. Because local tone mapping does avoid clipping, that's good because images generally look good without them being blown out, but sometimes the effect is not what you want. In that case, you'll need to cut back on local tone mapping before you try any highlight recovery. Let's look more at this image here. First, we're gonna look at the hot or clipped pixels. To do that, I click on the gray dot next to the word histogram. Red pixels are hot or overexposed, and blue pixels are black. So you'll see blue pixels at the bottom of the railing, for example, in parts of the roof, and then red over by the, the trees. But interestingly, you don't see any in the sky here. Now let's check the histogram, specifically the right edge of it. That's something local tone mapping tends to do. It doesn't seem to push values all the way to white. Moving local tone mapping, we can see a huge difference in the image, especially with the hot and cold pixels on. You can kind of see how the sky suddenly becomes clipped as we move it just off of local tone mapping. We'll turn off the hot pixel indicator and move it all the way across. So again, you can see what you've seen before. The bright areas get super bright and blown out, whereas the Areas that are in the dark part of the scene get very dark. So that's just local tone mapping balancing out the image. So if you don't like the look of local tone mapping or what it did to your highlights, then here's a simple way to get a similar look to what it's giving, but give you a lot more control over the final appearance. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put local tone mapping to about a half. And again, you'll see that a lot more is clipped. That's okay though. Okay, then, we're gonna go bring down exposure some, some with recovery, because we're focusing right now on the, uh, on the trees and stuff over here. And then we'll balance that off. We'll use a little bit more recovery on the bright areas, maybe a little bit of shadows, some lightning, maybe a little more. Okay, so now we have a differently balanced image see it before and after. So that's with local tone mapping applied and this is what we did on our own. The important message here though is if you like the way Apple's handling highlights then you can leave local tone mapping where it is but if you want to have more control over the highlights and the contrast of the image you're going to need to decrease local tone mapping sometimes a fair amount to get it out of the way enough that you can manipulate the highlights the way you want to. Local tone mapping does a great job on a lot of images, but sometimes you're gonna to need to rein it in. You may want to improve contrast in images, or maybe you want to do your own kind of highlight recovery, or you're applying an effect, or you need to push exposure more than local tone mapping is going to let you do. And finally, for some scenes, you're just gonna get better results with local tone mapping off than on. That sunset image was a good example of it. And if you want to do your own highlight recovery, you're gonna to have to dial LTM down at least some. That's part one of ProRaw editing, focusing on local tone mapping. Raw Power is available for iOS and Mac on the App Store. The Mac version is optimized for Apple Silicon, and there's a trial version that you can download at rawpower.app. To edit Pro Raw files, you need iOS 14.3 or Mac OS 11.1. .1. Check it out, and I'll see you later.